This is lesson number seven in our series, First and Second Thessalonians, preparing for the second coming. And in this lesson we're going to start Second Thessalonians, so you can open your Bibles there. We'll be reading out of that in a minute or two. Let's do a little review, shall we? about what this epistle, what these two epistles are about, the context, the history, so on and so forth. Let's take a couple of minutes to review that. First of all, in 51 AD, after spending a few weeks in the city of Thessalonica, preaching in a local synagogue, Paul establishes a congregation of the church in that place. And we find out that the young congregation had to survive in a port city, a large city, very wealthy, influential, but also very, very pagan. Uh, Paul was ultimately driven out of town by Jewish leaders and eventually he made his way to southern Greece to the city of Corinth. And then after a while he received a report from Timothy whom he had left behind in Thessalonica concerning the things that, are, that were going on in that church. And doesn't that make sense? There are a couple of people, they established a church, the main guy, the main teacher, Paul, you know, he gets, he gets you know, chased out of town but he leaves somebody behind to help them. And he gets information from them, from the, uh, from the people uh, who were left about the conditions in Thessalonica. And he responds to this news by writing two letters to this young church. Now in the first letter, uh, we said that Paul does four things very quickly. First, he expresses joy at their faithfulness in persevering in trials and adversity. That's the thing that gives them joy, the fact that they're hanging in there even though it's difficult. Secondly, he defends his conduct against charges that he was a fake and he was a, an imposter, an opportunist, uh, and so he defends his ministry. Three, he encourages them not to lose faith, continue serving God, and then finally, he teaches them about the second coming of Christ and how they should conduct themselves in the meantime. So that's the first letter is about that. Now in our study of 1 Thessalonians, we saw that Paul, among other things, was describing the true church and what that church looked like and acted like. And basically he said the following about the true church began with a true conversion. A true gospel was preached to people who were paying attention. Uh, there were um, true ministers who were ministering to that church, ministers who conducted themselves in a holy way. In other words, they walked the talk. Thirdly, true spiritual growth was taking place in that church. In other words, a true church acts a certain way. Uh, and he mentions uh, they are pure in all things, they, they are growing in their knowledge of Christ, knowledge of uh, Christianity continually, and they're ready for the return of Christ, and that's where he was really focusing. How to be ready for the return of Christ, because they didn't know when Jesus would return. As a matter of fact, they thought it was imminent, like it would be in their lifetimes. And that actually caused some problems. We'll talk about that. Now, in the second letter, which we're going to start today, the apostle continues in his praise of the Thessalonians, but he provides more information concerning the second coming, as well as an admonition to the church to deal with disorderly members. Now I want you to note that like his other epistles, this second epistle here is neatly organized, broken into three clear areas of material. So this is the outline, if you wish, of 2 Thessalonians. Chapter 1, verses 1 to 12, encouragement. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, education. In other words, some of the other things to look for when the end comes, when Jesus returns, you know, what are we to look for? And three, exhortation, chapter three, verses one to 18. Uh, encouragement, more encouragement. All right, so today we're going to start with the section on encouragement, chapter one, verses one to 12. Let's read the first two verses, shall we? He says, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this is where we find you know, internal evidence for Paul as the author of these letters. When you're trying to figure out who wrote the letter, you know, the authorship, you're looking for internal evidence 
and external evidence. External evidence are things like references about Paul's authorship, but found in other documents written at the same period. So if you find some documents that were written at that time, like non-inspired documents, histories, you know, other letters or correspondence between churches at that time, that actually mention Paul's, who wrote that letter, that's, that's external evidence that Paul is the writer of the letter. Internal evidence is evidence within the epistle itself that suggests or points to uh, the author. So I want you to note that Jesus' name, well, so Paul introduces, the very first word he mentions is himself, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy. So he names himself, names you know, the people that he's working with at the very beginning. And then I want you to note that Jesus' name is put in the same divine position as God's name. Very important theological idea there. Okay? Note that His name is in the same, same divine position, the one who gives the grace and power. It's God and Christ equals grace and power. And that points to the internal evidence that the apostles themselves actually believed that Jesus Christ was divine. People rarely you know, argue against that. You know, I mean, in, in all of Christendom, you know, all the various groups within Christianity, but uh, on the outside of that circle, there are people that say, where does it say, you know, where did they, did the apostles really believe that Jesus was this? Well, okay, you, you can go to 1 Thessalonians and you can point to this. This doesn't prove that He is, we have other ways of doing that, but it proves that the apostles believed that He was, that He was equal uh, with, uh, with God. So the point here is that the only combination that can produce grace and peace is the relationship between God and His church in Jesus Christ. So let's keep reading. He says, verse three, we ought to always give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged and the love of each one of you toward one another grows even greater. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. So he thanks God not for what they have given to him, but for who and what they are becoming in Christ Jesus. They are growing in strength and faith and love, and here's the, you know, the idea, they're doing this despite their persecution. It's not just you're hanging in there, but you are actually growing in faith and hope and love despite the persecution uh, that you're facing. So you know, this is the true reward of mature Christians, and that is seeing younger Christians whom they have mentored or led grow in Christ. It's really uh, quite exciting if you're in ministry long enough, you know, if you're in ministry, I mean 20, 30 years or more, uh, especially if you've been associated with one congregation for a long time, as, uh, Lee's and our family has here in Choctaw. I think we're counting 18 years uh, that we've been associated with the Choctaw congregation. You know, I've served this church in many capacities as a pulpit minister, as a missionary, now as a education and media. Uh, but the exciting thing is to see uh, the, the little girls and boys who were running around when I first came here, you know, running up the st on the stage, that seems to be a rite of passage. You know, every kid has to run up on the stage. You know, and those very same little kids now have brought their children to church. And we're seeing their children running up on the stage and now they have a new place, you know, the little, uh, the little uh, you know, uh, inclined ramp now, which is, a, and where the light switches have been conveniently placed at their height. <laughs> Anyways, it's always great, you see, to see a second generation following Christ. It's, it's a kind of a reward of the teachers and the elders and those, you know, those of you who have taught those little kids in Sunday school, uh, you know, those have grown up and maybe those people are teaching your grandchildren now in Sunday school. So there's a great reward in seeing younger Christians grow and, and, and mature in Christ. It's also the most painful and frustrating as well because a lot of those little kids that I saw growing up, many of them have let either left the church or gone into you know, terrible things and 
suffer terrible things and suffer terrible consequences because of their bad choices. So it's a kind of a, you know, it's a two, a two uh, emotion uh, experience. Of course, you cannot know the joy or the pain if you've never invested yourself in the growth and development of another person. You know, the, the surest way to grow in joy and Christian love is to invest yourself in the development of another person. You know, the old idea, you know, it isn't the minister ministering to 400 people, that's impossible. Even Jesus only had 12, you know, he just, 12 people he was mentoring. You know, the idea is that the church ministers to one, and, to one another. It requires every individual investing themselves in someone else in some way uh, at some point. So Paul is, is happy to see them growing. He's getting that satisfaction of seeing them uh, develop. Then he says in verse five, this is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. So Paul now addresses the sufferings that the Thessalonians are experiencing and God's righteous judgment concerning the sufferings that they are going through. So some of their trials stemmed from various you know, situations. First of all, the pagan society that they lived in was hostile to them. You know, we, we've experienced that in different ways, haven't we? I mean, you know, if you're working in a shop or a company or wherever where you are the only openly professed Christian, uh, there are a lot of you know, conflicts uh, that uh, you run into. You may be working in a place where people use foul language. Uh, you may be uh, 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 at a school that is teaching things that are you know, diametrically opposed to what you believe. You may be working for a company that supports certain practices that again are, uh, that go against your conscience. So living in a society that uh, that um, uh, is contrary to your beliefs is wearing. Imagine if you live in a pagan society. I mean, they, they don't even believe in God, one God. Uh, so they had to deal with that. Uh, the Jewish leaders, uh, these Christians who had been converted, many of them were, were Jews. The Jewish leaders were harassing them. The false teachers that had crept in among them were causing havoc in the church and the constant temptation by Satan to quit or to go back into the world was always there. You know, have you ever heard people say something like, man, this is just too tough. You know, I, I can't take this. You know, this is just, you know, I've had it. You know? and they say things like that. Well, you know, the, the, the Thessalonians were in that boat. You know, this is too hard. Why? It's not worth it. You know? So notice that their trials and challenges to their faith are not much different than what we experience today, as I said, in our time and in our culture. Paul talks about righteous judgment uh, in that passage. The word judgment is, uh, is made up of two ideas. Uh, first of all, separation, okay, and then decision. You separate, in other words, you separate what it is you know, uh, according to a law according to a principle. You separate what's acceptable from what's not acceptable and then you make a decision about what you're going to do about that. Basically that's what judgment is. And righteous, he says, God's righteous judgment. Righteous refers to a decision without any prejudice or malice. Just a decision based on principle and law, it doesn't matter who you're judging, doesn't matter what it is, you're, you're, everyone gets the same kind of judgment. And so Paul is saying that this is the kind of judgment that God will render to those who are attacking them. And he comforts them in their suffering by telling them, first of all, that their suffering is not in vain. Their suffering and their perseverance through it serves the greater good of helping establish the church in their isn't that, isn't that encouraging for us when we, when we see someone who shares our values and our faith and so on and so forth go through something and you see them go through that thing, whatever that is, can be illness or person, whatever it is, and they go through it maintaining, you know, we talked about last week, they're bearing, maintaining their faith and their hope, not using their persecution, not using their trials to kind of um, 
mm, uh, mm, respond in their you know, more base nature. You know, sometimes I've seen people who are suffering use their suffering as an excuse not to be tolerant of other people, as an excuse uh, to use poor language, as an excuse not to be loving, uh, because, you know, well, I'm suffering, so that suffering covers me if I want to act improperly, if I want to be vengeful, if I want to be rough, unkind. Well, it's the suffering talking. Don't mind, it. Don't, don't mind me, it's the suffering talking. Well, you know what, that doesn't wash. You know, who does that help? That doesn't help anyone. We're, we're not inspired by that. We're inspired by someone who maintains their bearing, maintains their faith and hope, maintains their love of other people despite their suffering. That's what, you know, that's what inspires us. Um, there is a cost attached to establishing the kingdom of God on earth. It began with Jesus' suffering, and it continues in each generation with the sufferings of the church to remain faithful and pure. It's not that Jesus didn't suffer enough to pay for our sins, that's not the issue. The issue is that He's not on earth, generation after generation, to continue suffering the things necessary to maintain the kingdom of God. We do that. That's, that's the part that we have to do. So we need to remember this when we suffer in some way in order to, especially in order to serve the church. Secondly, as far as his encouragement is concerned, he tells them that God not only permits them to suffer on behalf of the church, he also helps the church to endure. Now remember that God's answer to Paul when he cried out to be relieved of his thorn in the flesh, God answered by doing what? By giving him the ability to endure it. We think the only answer to our prayer when we're suffering is that God will remove that suffering. We think that's the only answer. You know, he, he either will remove it or He won't remove it. But there's a third answer and that is He gives you the things that you need to maintain your bearing, your faith, you know, your sanity through the difficulty that you're, that you're going through. That's also an answer to a prayer, but we don't always recognize it. You know, people, some people say, I don't, know how I, I don't know how I got through that. And I want to tell them, oh, I know how you got through that. God enabled you to go through that because if, it was, if you were all by yourself alone, you wouldn't have gone through it. And the difference for us is we either give Him the glory for it or not. We either give Him the glory for it or we, t or we take it for ourselves. People are saying, you're so strong, you're so wonderful. Yes, I <laughs> what can I tell you? And then the third way uh, that he encourages them because of their suffering, he, he tells them that God will punish later those who are making trouble now. And that's the answer, by the way, to the question, why does God allow suffering in the world? Why is it that Little children, innocent children are being barrel bombed you know, out in the Mer Middle East by evil dictators. What did they ever do to anybody? Why does God allow a, 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 a five-year-old boy to, have, you know, to, be, to be kidnapped and beaten? You know, why? I, we don't even want to talk about things like that. But why does, God, why does God allow that? There must be no God or God must not care or whatever. And the answer, the question should be, uh, the answer is, God allows it, but He does not allow it without judgment. That's the answer. The answer is, the ones who are doing this thing to those innocent children, that person will be judged. They're not going to get away with it. It's just that we want the judgment to be right away. And that's not how it works. So there will be a judgment. Monsters you know, like Hitler, who you know, took the easy way out, you know, he committed suicide in or, rather than be captured by the, uh, well not really by the Allies, but by the Russians. And all the other monsters in history, the, 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 the criminals who, who these people, deranged people who go into schools you know, and fire guns and injure and kill people, and then, oh, they kill themselves, and people say, well, you know, that was too good for him. You know, he, 
He should have suffered 40 years in jail, you know? Never mind 40 years in jail. I don't want to be in that guy's shoes when he comes before God in the judgment. I don't want to be in his shoes. Those, those, who, those who have enslaved women and children in, you know, in sex trades and stuff like that, you know, this horrible underbelly of society that we know it happens, even in our own city we know it happens. Yeah, there's going to be a judgment one day. And I don't want to be in the shoes of those people when the judgment comes. Yeah, you made your money and you had your whatever, quote, pleasures, but you, you just had that for a moment. That was just a moment. When the judgment comes, everybody will be judged. And so Paul is saying to them, you know, don't worry, the judgment will come. These and the wicked will suffer later, and the believers, he tells them, will find relief and rest, no more suffering. So Paul also gives details concerning the punishment of the wicked in this particular epistle. Now I want, I want to remind you, in 1 Thessalonians, he talks about what happens to the living and those sleeping when Jesus returns. You remember the sleeping are those who have died in Christ refers to them as sleeping. Okay? So in 1 Thessalonians he explains what happens to these people all right, when Jesus returns. And remember I told you a lot of things happen at the end of the world. A lot of things happen, but they happen simultaneously. And in 1 Thessalonians Paul is only describing one of the things that happens at the end of the world, and that is what happens to Christians who are alive and Christians who have died? What happens to them? That's the answer. Now, in 2 Thessalonians, he talks about what will happen to the unfaithful and the wicked when Jesus returns. Remember I told you, you have to kind of go to various sources to get all the information about what happens at the end of the world. So in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, we find out what happens to the faithful in 1 Thessalonians and what happens to the unfaithful in 2 Thessalonians. Just those two things. He doesn't talk about you know, the, the destruction of the world and the, the new heavens and earth. He doesn't talk about that. He doesn't talk about what happens to Satan. You know, he doesn't talk about that. He, he, he selects certain things to teach them. Okay? So let's read verse five and six uh, as far as judgment is concerned. So he says, for after all it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. So what's going to happen at the end? He says God will repay those who afflicted Christians and make them suffer. Now Paul says in Romans chapter 12 verse 19, revenge is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Imagine the Bible actually uses the word pay. <laughs> you know that, you know, payback. You know, we, we say, man, payback, you know. Payback is tough, isn't it? Or sometimes payback is sweet, isn't it? If you're on the, you know, on the other end of that. The Bible actually uses that word. He will pay back those who have made you suffer. Don't worry about that. In verse seven, he says, and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire. So here he says, Christ will come from heaven with angels and fire. And I like the word he uses, the Lord will be revealed. Because some people say, well, when the Lord returns, how am I going to know? How am I going to tell the difference between you know, the real Lord returning and the false Lord returning? What if I'm asleep? What if I'm in, you know, what, how, how will I know? Because it will be revealed. All right, now I ask a question. Who does God reveal stuff to? Well, He reveals stuff to believers. That's who He reveals stuff to. He doesn't reveal it to unbelievers. He reveals it to believers. You know, the unbelievers, as far as they know, uh-oh, what happened? What's happening? Uh-oh, the end is here. But believers will know exactly what's happening. What they have waited for, what they have hoped for, is now happening. What I'm trying to say is we won't be caught, quote, by surprise, like, uh-oh, what is this that's going on? We'll know what's going on. 
and we will not be, we will not be afraid. He talks about angels here, angels to announce His coming and glory and fire to fulfill His judgment against the wicked. In the Bible, fire is usually either a testing or a judgment. In this case, it represents God's judgment. And then in verse eight and nine, it says, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. So those who do not know God, those are the evil and wicked ones, and those who do not obey the gospel are the same. Look, those who don't obey the gospel. What is necessary for you to not obey the gospel? Well, you must have heard it. You must have heard it and not obeyed it. So he includes two groups here. The wicked, they don't know God, and because they don't know God, this leads to their actions, right? And those who have not obeyed the gospel, in other words, those who knew but chose to disobey. He says, these will suffer eternal destruction or punishment away from God. You know, my thing is, people who don't believe in hell, you know, I bring them to this passage and I say, well, how do you how do you massage this passage to mean there is no eternal destruction? Because it just says right there, they will pay the penalty. It's a penalty of what? Eternal destruction. <laughs> How can you turn that into a comfortable sleep? <laughs> or some sort of annihilation where I'm not aware of anything. This is by God's decree and He says a just punishment. People who say God is unfair are mistaken. Do you know, even those who are condemned will say, yep, that was fair. You ever think of that? Even the ones condemned, they're going to say, yeah, I deserve this. There's not going to be people screaming and yelling, that's not fair, and blah. no. No, no, they will see the fairness of it. To be, and what's the, what's the punishment? To be deprived of the sight of the Lord will be the substance of the punishment and it will be eternal. I mean, not being with the Lord. And some say, well, how's that a big punishment? Well, let's see, with the Lord there's light, truth, joy, happiness, love, knowledge, joy, glory, power, eternal life, you know, all of those, that's, that's with the Lord. And so if you're not with the Lord, then it's darkness, suffering, fear, ignorance, all those other things. You know, those old jokes about, man, I want to be with my buddies in hell because that's where the beer is and it's going to be a honky tonk and we're going to have a good time. No, you won't. No, you won't. Yeah, well, <laughs> must be your cologne. <laughs> Verse 10, when He comes to be glorified, in His saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed, for our testimony to you was believed. So all of this will happen, he says, when Jesus comes. The believers will reflect His glory, meaning they will be glorified, you know, they will have the resurrected body, so they will be in the same state that He is in. Believers will rejoice and marvel at His presence because they were faithful in their belief. Have you ever had the experience of like dodging a bullet? You, know, you say, boy, I dodged the bullet. You know, we were supposed to, we had to decide, turn left or right, and I decided, well, we're going we're to take the highway right and find out later that the highway left led to a washed out bridge or something. You go, wow, you know, one of those things. Can you imagine the relief we'll have when Jesus returns? I think a lot of people saying, man, oh wow, oh, I'm so glad I hung in there. Um, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The rest, he says, unbelievers, wicked, will vanish from His presence. See, the thing is, they'll be in His presence and then they'll re be removed from His presence. There's, that's where the suffering comes in. Because there'd be no suffering if you didn't see what it was that you were going to have but they're going to see Him come, and then they're going to be removed. There's, there's where the suffering. And all of this happens, again, 
the twinkling of an eye. So he begins, he finishes out with his prayer. He says, to this end also we pray for you always, that our God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power, so that, in, uh, so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in Him according to the grace of our God and the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. So Paul continues in his constant prayer for them. Remember I said the beginning is a prayer, thanksgiving, appreciation, encouragement. His prayer request, however, is very specific. It is that God complete the work that He began in them. So his prayer is that God finish the thing that He originally called them for through the gospel. So God calls us through the gospel for what? to separate ourselves from this world and begin to follow and become like His Son, Jesus Christ, in order to prepare ourselves for the next world. That's why you can't have one foot in this world and one foot in it. You can't serve God and mammon. You're in the process of preparing yourself for another reality. So we begin on this road of change and transformation when we respond to the gospel with faith as we express that faith in repentance and baptism, of course, Acts 2.38. Now this initial event changes us from lost to saved, from condemned to justified, from outcast to son or daughter, from prisoner of sin to free from sin and the death that comes with it. So another thing begins to happen to us at this moment as well. We receive the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. And through the influence of the Holy Spirit, God's word and the church, we begin a process of growth and development and maturity called sanctification. At baptism, we are justified. The, the doctrine of justification says that your sins are forgiven. When you stand before God, you're justified, you're forgiven, you're acceptable. That's the doctrine of justification. The doctrine of sanctification is the process that you go through as you begin to mature in Christ. And one of the biggest mistakes we make sometimes in, in Christian understanding is we confuse justification with sanctification. Justification happens just one time. It's a historical thing. The day we confess Christ, repent and are baptized, we are justified. That happens one time. You don't get any more justified the day after you're baptized. 20 years from your baptism, you're just as justified as you were on the day you were baptized. There's no, you know, you're free, you're free. It's like being born. You know, a baby is born. Is that baby any more born the second day, the fifth day, when they're 12 years old, right? They're born, they're born. So in justification, you're born again. Well, you're born again, you're alive, spiritually. Sanctification is the maturation process that takes place. Just like that little baby is born, it's alive, right? But it learns to walk and it learns to talk and so on and so forth. Same idea in Christianity. Through justification, we're born. In the waters of baptism, we're reborn. And then, through a process of maturation called sanctification, we mature, we grow. And Paul is saying that what, what Jesus will do is when He comes, He's going to top up, He's going to finish up that process of sanctification that we have been going through our entire lives. So Paul refers to this phenomenon when he prays that the work, the work of sanctification will be completed when Jesus returns. And it's the thing we're looking forward to. You know those spiritual moments in your prayer life when you say to yourself, you know, I'm so sick of my flesh I am so sick of this body. The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I do, I don't want to. You know, that feeling that I'm just not good enough. Never mind living up to what God wants me to do. I can't even live up to what I want me to be. <laughs> I, 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 I see my better self and somehow I can never reach my better self. Never mind the image that God has of me. Well, that yearning there that you have, that we all have as Christians, Paul is saying that yearning will finally be satisfied when Jesus returns. 
You know, Jesus said it another way, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Yeah, when will they be completely satisfied? Only when Jesus returns. In the meantime, we feel hungry for it. Every little victory, every gain is good, but we, we, we get to that mountain and we see another one ahead. And we're motivated to go, but sometimes it's a little tired. Spiritually, we become exhausted from time to time. And that's why he's, that's why he's encouraging them. So when Jesus returns, we will shed this mortal body and will be filled with a body that is able to exist in the spiritual world. I think of those guys that go to the Ebola you know, in Africa, man, they tape them and they, they have to have a special you know, outfit for hazmat to be able to, to, to exist there and to help those people. Well, it's a kind of a rough, a rough parallel here, but we need a different body to exist in the next dimension. This body will not exist in the next dimension because in the next dimension, we're in the presence of God. This body cannot stand to be in the presence of God. We need a new body. We need a different kind of body to be able to exist in that particular dimension. And this is what Paul is saying here. God will equip you to be in that, in that other dimensions. So when Jesus returns, as I say, we'll shed our mortal bodies. Now some people have questions about cremation because of the resurrection. I've heard that a lot. You know, should I be cremated you know, when the Lord comes? At the resurrection, we will not be taking back the old flesh. No matter what condition or place that it's in, whether it's in the ground or at sea or in ashes or, you know, we, we're not taking back that body. Even if we die one minute before Jesus returns, that ain't the body we're taking. We're not coming back in this body. Who, who, anybody want to come? Now I'm looking at you, Dave. Anybody want to come back in this body? Yeah, yeah. We don't, we don't, we don't want to come back in this body. And then Paul uh, prays that in the meantime, until Jesus returns, this mutual honor continues. In other words, Christians honor God with their faith and their good works until Jesus returns, and God blesses man by helping to mature and grow in Christ until the day comes when they'll be perfectly like Him with their resurrection and their glorification. This kind of reciprocal blessing should continue until Jesus returns and the process of sanctification will be complete. And the process will be complete when sinners will be judged once for all and saints will be brought to heaven once and for all time. So let's kind of summarize. Paul begins his second letter to this young church by encouraging them to persevere in faithfulness to the word, loving kindness to one another and firm hope of their reward. And he does this by reminding them of one major idea. One day, God will bring His judgment on all men. You can take that to the bank. And those who remain faithful will be rewarded, and those who don't or reject the truth, they will be punished. And the reward will be a wonderful reward, a reward worth waiting for. And the punishment, a frightening thing, a punishment worth Avoiding, that's what he's saying. You know, some people say, wow, we had a you know, hell and brimstone lesson. No, uh, you know, we're following the text here, line by line, measure by measure, chapter by chapter. This is what Paul uh, is saying to the church there and to the church here today. So if you look around, you do see injustice and wickedness in this world, and you don't have to go far to see lazy people and hypocrites in the church. You don't have to go far for that. Now these may be, there may be some good excuses to get angry or discouraged and walk away from God and His church, but these type of excuses work only if you're looking at the short view. You know, people who quit on believing because they're suffering in the world and they charge God with that crime. You know, God, there is no God. They're suffering in the world, therefore I'm just washing my my hands of God. Or you know, there's a, you know, this deacon over here not doing his job and he's a hypocrite or his wife's a hypocrite or she's a gossip. You know, so I'm just washing my hands of the church. You know, forget it. You know? Well, that may be a good excuse for you to walk away from God, but that's not a good excuse uh, for you to skip judgment. That's what Paul is saying here. These type of excuses work only if you're looking at and taking the short view. In the long view, which is God's view, all wrongs will be righted. All liars will be revealed. 
all the lazy and the hypocrites will be exposed and all the faithful ones will be rewarded. God knows who are His. He knows the ones that belong to Him. So our work as Christians is not to judge or punish or to decide. These are God's prerogatives. Our job is to make sure that we are faithful in our lives and witness so that we can share in the glorious witness of Jesus when He comes. Let's never forget that there will be both reward and punishment. And our job, you know, my job number one, be faithful. While you're sick, be faithful. While you, you, know, you have a bonanza and you got a lot of money, be faithful. While somebody hurts you, be faithful. And you know, be faithful. I've got this screen thing on my computer you know, that says, be faithful, to remind myself, no matter what happens today, be faithful. My response to what happens to me in my life, in my family life, is to be faithful. And that's what Paul is encouraging the church here. Okay, so that's our introduction to Thessalonians. We're going to get into the man of lawlessness, who is the man of lawlessness, and all that kind of stuff in the next couple of lessons. All right, thank you for your attention.